right, today we're looking again at our snapshots from a spiritual journey. And a spiritual journey is the one that Moses is taking. And uh, we saw last time that they passed through the Red Sea and uh, God was just doing incredibly miraculous things. Well, I want to talk today about a few lessons from the school of life. We're all in that school of life. Uh, some call it school of hard knocks, some call it different things. I just call it the school of life. And today I want to focus on three stories that are, are in the following chapters, 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> Each one of these could be a message all by itself, but I, I want to talk about these three stories. The first one is the story about bitter water. The second one is the story about no food. And the third one is the story about no water. <clears throat> All of these stories have connecting points. There is a unifying concept in all of them. In fact, the unifying concept has two points. A test. Well, of course, when you're in school, you get a test, right? That's, that was the part I hated when I was teaching. I taught in a seminary, Michigan Theological Seminary. And, and I hated doing the test because then I had to grade the papers. Grading like, like murder. Giving tests was easy. There's that grading you had to do. Well, <clears throat> there's a test. And then you can get, you know, you can either have a satisfactory grade or a dissatisfactory grade. And what we're going to find in our passage here, and, and, and each of these stories, there's a test because they're in the school of life. They've seen the blessings of God, and now God's testing them. And we're going to find that in each case, there's a dissatisfactory grade because they have dissatisfaction. The first test, it says, There the Lord put them to test, and the people complained against the teacher, Moses. Didn't like the teacher. But we see in the next chapter, In that way, I tested them, the Lord said, and the whole congregation complained. The third one, we find the Israelites tested the Lord. Okay? The people quarreled with Moses. It goes on also says, and they complained. They complained. I think from these three stories, there are three important lessons to learn. And the first lesson uh, that we're going to learn from these stories is life can be bitter. I don't know if you know that. I mean, somebody might have told you, you know, uh, if you accept Jesus, everything will be wonderful in your life, the rest of it. Now, that's not exactly true. Um, there are tests in life. Life can still be bitter. In, in fact, when I'm talking about bitter, I'm saying that life can be hard to bear, very grievous. It can be very distressful. I picked that up from chapter 15 in Exodus and the snapshot that Moses has given of this incident that happens at Mara. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was Mara. It was bitter. Watch what he says next. That's why they called it Mara. Four times he says, it's bitter. It's bitter. It's bitter. I want to suggest to you life can be very bitter. I'm going to jump four or five hundred years forward in time. It's, they've already gone into the land and conquered the land. Uh, they're dwelling in the land. Joshua's already passed on. It's in the time of the judges. And it says in a little book in the Old Testament called Ruth, in the times of the judges, there was a famine in the land. The land was where God told them to be. He gave them the land. It was his, his will for them to be in the land. But there was a famine in the land. And then it goes on and says in the very first verse, And there was a man of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, Bethlehem means house of bread. House of bread. Judah means praise. Praise God, I got a full house of bread. Now, all the names in the story mean something. And it goes on and says there was a certain man from Bethlehem, Judah, and his name was Elimelech. In Hebrew, it's Elimelech. It means, my God is king. So here's the story. A man whose name is, my God is king, dwells in the house of bread. Praise the Lord. See what I'm getting from the names there? And, and so he, he lives there. And, and then it says, but there was a famine in the land. And so he was married to this gal. Her name is Naomi. Now, the name Naomi means pleasant, beautiful, uh, gracious. Her name has a personal pronoun on it, my pleasantness. 
It's as if she she had a life that was just wonderful and pleasant. So this guy whose name is My God is King, he's married to a gal whose name is My Pleasantness, and they live in the house of bread, and they praise. Do so you want to get any of the names of the story? No. They have two sons. The names of the sons are kind of, whoa, what's going on in the story? The one's name is Kilian, the other one's Ma- Malan. And the one means sickly, and the other one means pining away. And as the story unfolds, well, because of the famine, they look to the land of Moab. Moab means the land of my father. Well, the father that was named was Lot, and Lot was a man who liked the world rather than he did the land where God wanted him. So he looks to this place that is not the will of God, and he says, listen, I'm going to pack up my family. We're going to go to Moab. Well, he goes to Moab, and as it happens, the guy whose name is my God is King dies outside the land outside the will where God wanted him. Ten years later, I mean, the sons, of the two sons have gotten married to two gals. One's name is Orpah. Now, Orpah, strangely enough, her name means back of the neck. The other one's name is Ruth. Ruth's name means friendship, friendly. So these two guys, sickly and pining away, marry, you know, the back of the neck and marry, a, you know, a friendship, and uh, then the two boys die. And so now Naomi, who's my pleasantness, has lost my God, is king, sickly and pining away. Then she hears back in the land where she's supposed to be, God is blessing. There's no more famine. In fact, it's barley season. They got a bumper crop. So she decides she's going to go back. She tells her two daughters, daughter-in-laws, I'm going back. And they say, oh, we're going to go with you. And if, just to make the long story shorter, uh, the one that's named Oprah, and, and uh, 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 she says to her, to both of them, listen, I don't have any sons for you to marry. Even if I had a son right now, would you wait till they're old enough to marry them? No, go back to your, to, to your, your, your own people. So Orpah, her name is back and neck, she turns back, she leaves. See how that plays out? But Ruth's name is friendly, friendship. She says, no, where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God and ever bring any curse upon me if I do not fulfill my vow of friendship to you. So she goes back to the land. Now they're coming back to the land and people see Naomi and they said, whoa, what's happened to her? Can this be Naomi? Can this be my pleasantness? She says, stop calling me my pleasantness. Call me Mara. That's what this text says. Call me bitterness. Because the hand of the Almighty has dealt with me bitterly. She blames it all on God. Isn't that what we do? When there's a little test in life, we try to do it our own way, and we stomp our foot at God, says, oh, your fault, God. She says, don't call me my pleasantness. Call me bitterness, Mara. I went out full, she said, and I came back empty. There's a problem that we have. I call it rewriting history. If you go back through the story, she did not go out full. There was a famine in the land. They didn't have anything. But now she's rewriting it and saying, no, it was better then than it is now. And she's coming back empty. Well, Ruth came back with her. Can you imagine how that made Ruth feel? What am I, chopped liver right here? I've come back. I've covenanted to be your friend. I will be with you to the end. And you're going back empty? Anyway, Mara means bitterness. And life can be bitter. When they came to this place called bitterness, and that's why it's called... uh, Mara, the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried out to the Lord. This is so important. He cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He said, now take that that piece of wood, throw it in the water, and the water will become sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance. He set up a rule to live by. And there he put him to test. 
Oh, he gave them a rule and said, now live by this rule. Here's the statute and the ordinance. Where is it? What is it there to live by? I think it's in the next verse. He said to them, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God. And where do I find that voice? I'll tell you where we find that voice, folks. Right here in this book. He says, if you will listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right, you find out what God wants you to do, and you do it. You just do it. And you give heed to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. These are the terms he's going to later refer to the Torah as. He's saying the word of God. Listen to the word of God. He says, then if you do that, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. It's interesting that he calls the plagues here diseases. The plagues, you remember, there were the flies, there were the frogs, you know, there were all these, all these different water turning to blood. He says, but associated with all of those, there must have been then a disease that followed. He said, I won't bring any of these upon you, for I am the Lord who heals, and you expect him to say, your water, because that's what he's just done. He's, he's taken bitter water and made it sweet and drinkable. But he says, no, I, don't, I didn't heal the water, I heal you. It's because you are far more important than any of the stuff of life. You ever pray, like when you take your car to the mechanic and you pray, Lord, I just pray that bill will be really low? <laughs> Almost, I'm the only one that does that? <laughs> okay. That's just the stuff of life. He's not saying I'm going to heal your car, but I'll take care of you, me. I'll heal you. The Lord who heals. You see, life can be bitter. And I don't know what bitter experiences you're, you've been through, you're going through, or you will go through. But life can be bitter. When it is, the text says, do this. Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. And Jesus put it very simply. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Secondly, life can be empty. Life can be empty. Uh, that is, on the gas tank of life, <laughs> there's nothing keeping you going. Every now and then, I think every, every normal person has an experience so bad, they just say, I wish I would die. I wish I'd just curl up in a ball and die. Because there's a circumstance in our life so terrible <clears throat> well, it says the whole congregation of the Israelites complained to Moses, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. You know, remember the firstborn of all the sons in the land where the blood was not applied? They died. They said, I wish I would have just died with the Egyptians. When we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Now, come on, this is just like Naomi all over again. I went out empty. Okay, I mean, I, I, I went out full and came in empty. And, and now she, they're saying, listen, we had it so good in Egypt. Are you kidding me? They were slaves. He was putting taskmasters over them to kill them. They were telling, hey, drown the baby boys. You had it so good? See why I call this rewriting history? We rewrite it and we think, oh, we had, we're just belly aching and complaining. He said, for you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We're starving to death here, Lord. We have no food. Sometimes life can feel like <clears throat> I'm starving of anything important in life. I have no purpose. It's meaningless. I just want to quit. I'd rather just die. <clears throat> That's where they're at at this point. And then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to rain bread from heaven. And each day the people will go out and they'll gather enough for that day. In that, in that way I will test them whether they are following my instructions or not. Boy, I'll tell you what. First thing I got to do when I'm having one of those empty spells in my life, I got to get to the instructions and find out what am I doing wrong here? What should I be doing? My tank is empty. My life is meaningless. i got to get back, connect with the meaning, purpose of life. 
whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, do it all for the glory of God. I got to get back on track. <clears throat> he says, your complaining is not against us, that's Moses and Aaron, but it's against the Lord. I think I'm still in the honeymoon period of church. You're all way too kind to me. <laughs> Moses had passed the honeymoon period. They're complaining about the leader. I don't think he knows what he's doing. He brought us out here to die. He's starving us to death. And he's, Moses, listen, I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. You got a problem? Tell it to God. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord. When life is bitter, you cry out to the Lord. When life is empty, you draw near to the Lord. For he has heard your complaining. I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them at twilight, as it starts to get dark, you shall eat meat. And in the morning, you shall have your fill. You're going to have your fill of bread. Remember what, what, what Naomi said? Uh, I went out full, came back empty. I'm empty. No, no, listen. When she returned to the land, if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, it's, it's barley season. It's the harvest. And, and they get food they didn't even work for. God then starts replenishing, starts replenishing. He says, you shall have your fill of bread. You're, you're going to be fill, filled up with bread. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. In the evening, quail got off course, came through the wilderness, probably tired out, settled down in their area, and they had a quail feast. And in the morning, he says, there was a layer of dew. Remember, it rained down, the dew came down, covers the ground. And when the dew lifted, there was this fine, flaky stuff. They don't even know what to call it. It's fine as frost on the ground. So I don't know how thick frost is, but this substance was that thin, okay? And they had to go out and, and gather it up. And they, says, they said to one another, I said, well, what is it? In Hebrew, that is manna. So we call manna. We're saying, what is it? It's what, it, what is it bread? You know, you go to the store and you get your wheat bread, you get your rye bread. They were collecting, what is it bread? <laughs> what is this stuff? And they could do all kinds of things with it. They could boil it or bake it. They, they collected up as much as they needed and they would be satisfied with that. You couldn't carry it over to the next day because it would rot and stench and smell and maggots would get in it. So you only got enough for one day. Except on Friday. Every Friday, you collected enough for two days. And on Saturday, which was the Sabbath, it, it, it never got maggots in it, didn't stink. But if you carried it one more day over. So he said, hey, on Friday, be sure you collect enough for two days. Sure enough, the people messed up. They tried to save it over to the next day. And it stunk, had, had maggots in it. On Friday, they only collected enough for the day, so I'll just go out on the Sabbath and get it. And I got out there and there wasn't any. You see, the Lord said, I want to see if you will just follow my instructions. That's the test. Folks, this book is our instruction book. God wants us just to follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. Moses said to them, I said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Life can be empty. It can be empty. And when it is, the passage says, you draw near to the Lord. Draw near to the Lord. When life is bitter, you cry out to him. When life is empty, you've got to get close to God. You've got to walk with God. Walk with him. He'll fill your emptiness. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. You draw near to Christ. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. God wants you to experience life to the max. He doesn't want to hold out on you at all. He wants you to have the very best. All that he created you to be. Third thing, life can be threatening. 
chapter 17. There's a story. And this one, the circumstances can be very life-threatening. Very life-threatening. It says there that the Israelites camped at Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Not bitter water. It wasn't a food problem. There is no water. There's approximately two million people and no water. Even when they said they had no food, they could have sacrificed, you know, they could have killed some of their animals that they brought along and eaten. But there's no water. This is very life-threatening. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water. And Moses is like the preacher and says, I can't, what, what, am I God that I can make, make the water? You're going to the wrong person. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out to Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Oh, how quick we forget what God has done and all the goodness he's done in the past. Instead of saying, well, you know what? God changed the bitter water to sweet water. God provided quail. And look, he gives us manna every day. Hey, Moses, you think maybe you could hook us up with God again so he could provide some water? They complain. They get angry. They're bitter. Accuse God of wanting just to kill them. So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. God, they're taking it out on me. And the Lord said to Moses, go. And I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come from it so that the people may drink. And so Moses went over, did just as he said. He struck the rock in the sight of all these elders who were complaining. And out gushes a stream to satisfy the need for two million people. That's more than the metro Detroit area. Enough water. Now listen to me. Life can be threatening. I don't know what's threatening your life, what you think is threatening your life. When it is, you need to realize that I will stand there before you. I will stand there before you. Now, we're going to find in just a moment that the rock in the New Testament, it says it was Christ. Christ is the rock. And when he said to smite the rock, you're smiting Christ. Listen, Christ has been smitten already for us. On the cross, he took the nails. He died there for us. Listen to what Jesus has said. Actually, Paul says this about Jesus. For they in the wilderness, he's referring to this passage in the New Testament. He said they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Moses Representing all the complaining, the sinfulness of the people, complaining to God. Their sins smite Jesus. They smite Jesus. And out of Jesus, listen to what Jesus says. The water that I give will become a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Isn't that exactly what he did on the cross? He died so that he might take away our sins as a substitute for us and impute to us eternal life. Out of him, gushing eternal life. That if I would just believe in him, I would have life eternal. He wants us to not be on empty any longer, but he wants us to be on full. The place was named. The first one was Mara, bitterness. He called the second place Masa, tested. Third one, Meribah, quarreled because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord. In the school of life, they were given a test and they got a dissatisfaction grading. They were dissatisfied. And here's what it sums up saying. Here's the essence. They were saying, is the Lord among us or not? We don't say it like that today. Here's how we say it. Where is God when you need him? And they're right. Not the way we phrase the same thing. Where is God when you need him? It's like God is letting us down. I got the answer to that question. It's found several times in the Bible. In the Deuteronomy, Moses writes this, the Lord your God who goes with you. Where is he? He's with you. Watch this. He will not fail you or forsake you. Watch this. 
He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Two times in same passage. He said, listen, I want you to get the point. In the New Testament, the author of the book of Hebrews says this, I will never leave you or forsake you. Get the picture? Another passage. Jesus said, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here's the point. Even when life seems bitter, life seems empty, life seems threatening, Jesus said, I am with you always. Always, always, always. Even to the end of the age. Jesus is with you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to learn from the snapshots that Moses has given us from the school of life. To stop our belly aching and complaining when life's a little bitter or it's a, oh Lord, we're feeling a little empty or something is threatening us. Instead, Lord, we, we want to cry out to you we want to draw near to you. And we want to realize, just realize, that you are with us. You can part the Red Sea. You can walk on water. Lord, you can do the miraculous at your time. And we need to just stand still in our faith and acknowledge that you are God. Perhaps today someone here is troubled in their spirit. Maybe a little bitterness is in their heart. Maybe they just feel an emptiness in their soul. Maybe they feel a dryness and a barrenness. And Lord, they need that gush of water to give them the full, abundant life of eternal life. Bring it to them today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.